Thanks, Wendy. I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the Acting Director of the Wyoming State Cloud Mill Office and the Water Resources Data System. I'd like to welcome you all to our August Wyoming Conditions and Outlooks presentation, which is put on by my office, the USGS, the National Weather Service, uh, University of Wyoming Extension, along with the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub, the State Engineer's Office, Bureau of Land Management, and the Wyoming State Forestry Division. And today we're gonna to look at uh, current conditions, uh, what, the, what the future has in store for us and how you can get involved. So jumping right in, here is uh, the drought monitor map for this, uh, actually it's Tuesday morning, but it was released uh, this morning. This is a weekly product that goes from Tuesday to Tuesday and shows uh, the current State of, state of Wyoming and actually the, the country itself, but we're gonna concentrate on Wyoming, obviously. And these red areas here, quite a few of them throughout the entire state are areas that have been degraded at least one drought category since the last webinar that we had back in July. And the little area down here is the one sole area that is, has improved a little bit since, since we last talked. Uh, let's go in a little bit and talk about what goes into that drought monitor. We did a little bit last month on, on some of the things, and I showed a sort of a, a random location throughout Wyoming and sort of showed how uh, percentiles, which is what the drought monitor is based on, differ from a percentage. But this time, I want to take a look at some, uh, some actual points on the ground. And the first one is going to be this area over here in Fremont County with the red dot. And then these are the precipitation values for June, June totals from 1895 through 2021. Now, obviously these are modeled gridded data since there's very few locations around the state that have long-term serially complete data that we can look at like this. So unfortunately we do have to fall back to, to the, the gridded data, but uh, that is what we have. So, Looking here, this is uh, June of this year, and we can see that we had uh, 0.61 inches. And down here on this second, second graph, I've sorted the values from smallest to largest, so we can kind of see what the distribution is across the entire range of precip totals that we've gotten. And this 0.61 shows up right around there, which uh, when you look at how these percentiles are based, these, all these values are broken into uh, these lines here are for uh, increments of 10% each. So here's 10% of the values here, another 10% of the values, et cetera. So when you look at where this value lays here, you can see we're about the 36th or so percentile, which when you come over here and look at how the drought classification is based, which is strictly on percentiles, you can see that really, we're not in a drought category at that particular spot. Although when you look up here at the map for June, this is the, the last drought monitor that was issued and, and covers the month of June. If you look at the previous 30 days, that 61 hundredths comes into an area that is actually in D0, which is actually one category below what we would be showing here. So let's step forward and look at that same spot. Uh, I won't go into as much detail on this one, but this is the, the July values for each month. And here we see we ended out July with a total of 0.53 inches, which when you come down here and look at the distribution is actually even higher up. We're around the 45, 46 percentile. But again, we come down here, that would be in a, an area with no drought category, no D0, one, two, three, or four. But when you look at uh, what the map was showing, we're showing a D1 here. So conditions have gotten worse, even though the precip value is, is showing a little bit higher compared to where, you know, what the, the distribution is. So now let's, let's take another location and do this again. This is in Sublette County, so the center of the county here. And we look at the June totals and we come out at 0.16 inches, which when you look at it in terms of the percentile is way down here around seventh or so percentile, which puts us in the D2 category. And lo and behold, when you look at the map here for that point for June, uh, looking at one month, we're in D2. So then let's go forward to July and do the same thing. And we see a 0.37 as the July total which brings us down here to about the 26th or so, 26, 27th percentile. 
which would put us in D0. However, when you look at the category for, this is at the end of July, which would take into account the July precipitation, we're looking at D3 conditions. So obviously it's not just precipitation we're looking at, which is, which is one of the misconceptions I think about the drought monitor is that it strictly looks at precipitation, but it goes into many other factors. And one of the big ones is what is the time length involved? So now let's look at the June and July precipitation values for that uh, spot on the ground. And we see a 0.53 for the total. This is uh, adding both June and July together. And when you look at those totals sorted, you're still down here. It turns out to be the seventh percentile, which is just one percentile into the D2, which can, you can kind of see why we would be in extreme drought with those, with those values. But as I said, there's other, other things you look at rather than straight precipitation totals. And up here on the top are uh, 60 and 90 day precipitation percentiles, but instead of showing what the percentile is, whether it's like 10th, 20th, whatever percentile, I've taken those values that you see here and color coded them so that the value on the ground that you're seeing here, like this yellow here, are all precipitation percentiles that would fall into the D0 category. And then coming down here, you can see this is what we call the standardized precipitation evaporation index, evapotranspiration index, which I usually get into a little bit later on in the, in the presentation and talk about that in terms of what the standardized precipitation index. And the SPEI, which we're showing here, is based on the SPI. So a little explanation of what those are. The SPI takes uh, precipitation totals over various time intervals, and it fits those to a normal distribution and then calculates uh, the number of standard deviations away from the mean, median value that those that a particular value is. And so the values are going to sort of center around zero, which indicate neutral conditions, and positive values then being wet and negative values being dry. What the SPEI does is it's based on that SPI, but it takes it one step further and looks at evapotranspiration and throws that into the mix. So it's looking not only at the precipitation, but then also the moisture demand in the atmosphere. So it gives a little bit better uh, uh, measure of what the conditions are on the ground as far as how the precipitation and the moisture available is being used. And so with those, you've still got that same range of values with the positive ones being wet and the negative ones being, being on the dry side. And so with these maps here, which are showing SPEI, I've also color coded those to show what the relevant uh, drought category was. So if the, your SPEI were between like a minus 1.6 and a minus 2.0, that's gonna be showing up on this map as D3 or extreme drought conditions. And so if we look at these maps um, in the 60 day medium term here, looking at this, we're, you can see the same sort of pattern showing up. This is the current drought monitor map here that was released on, two, on this morning for Tuesday. And you do see some similar similarities here in terms of intensity, but looking back 90 days, you can see that standing out a lot more with this D3 up here in the Northeast, uh, some of it here in the, in the central, north central part of the state. But one thing you notice is that by and large, we're not seeing the D3, except in some of these categories, you know, these areas here, we're seeing a little bit better conditions than are actually being detected on the, on the drought monitor. So, if you were just looking at that precipitation, the situation might actually look better than is being depicted. And one thing that is causing a lot of these D3s areas to show up and some of these worst conditions compared to the D2 here versus the D1 that you're seeing in the 90 day is you look at these other elements such as soil moisture and stream flow, which I won't get into, as Aaron will talk about that a little bit. But when you throw these in and you look at a, uh, a convergence of these indicators, that's what gives you what your drought category is in an area versus just looking at one particular parameter. So now let's go in and just uh, look at our, our usual uh, maps here. This is the 14 day precipitation, uh, again, shown as a percentile. These are showing the actual percentile values, not the drought category. And you can see the areas of concern, which are, uh, you know, below median areas, areas of concern here in the Bighorns, the Northeast, uh, Sublette County, the Upper Green, South Central, and then a few areas here in the Southwest, uh, 
Teton County that are showing above the median and then a few gray areas where we're about neutral conditions. And this is looking at the same parameter. This is the precipitation percentile again, but this is looking over the last 90 days and a fairly, fairly similar picture emerging here. You still have these areas above, above the median down here in the Southwest, uh, West, South in the central area here, uh, Niagara Weston County boundary here. We've got some, some wetter areas. And then the whole Northern portion here, we're below the median, South Central up into the upper green. And over here in the, the east, southeast, we're starting to see some, some uh, dryness emerging. Uh, this is the standardized precipitation index map that I was talking about earlier. I won't go into the, the makeup of it here now, but uh, here, here's that area again that's starting to show up as you look back in the time, uh, 30, 60, and 90 days. We have a consistent signal starting to emerge at those, those time periods that indicates things are, are starting to really deteriorate here. Uh, the wetness here in the central part of the state where we're still in the, the D1 category, uh, although we are getting up into the D2s here and, and D3s, but we're seeing, seeing conditions here back 90 days where we were pretty red, a little bit of uh, improvement. And now we see what we're starting to, starting to go back into darker colors up in here. Now, one thing last month that, uh, that David King up in Campbell County brought up was uh, anomaly or different spots in the map where, you know, wondering if, are there actual values there or is there is it some, uh, something there that's artificial? And I look at a particular spot that he had, had pointed out and I don't see a particular station there. He was indicating an area right around here and I don't have any stations there. There is one right about here and then a couple over in here. So. I still think it may either be a, um, uh, a contouring algorithms for you know, how they do the interpolation and extrapolation of values in between points, or it could be that it's, it's actual values that are brought in from uh, radar estimated precipitation, which do go into those products. However, if you look right about here, you can see a rather interesting anomaly that sort of follows the, the, the county boundary here. And this is between county warning, county warning areas of the National Weather Service. Uh, right in this mix over in here. So whether or not radar data is being picked up from both sides and multiplied or added to it, each other, we're not sure. And, and some people are looking into this to see why this particular artifact is showing up here. But I don't really believe the wetness that we're seeing right on the county line here. And you can see it show up in the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index as well, um, especially down here where it's, it's kind of muted, but you can see the line going across. But you see in this, this map, some of the same, same characteristics, you got some real dryness starting to emerge down here in the east central and southeast area. And then the continued dryness up here in the, in the northeast where we do have uh, D3 already. We want to look at the 14-day, uh, the, uh, the last two weeks, the average minimum temperature. Uh, here's the actual temperature up on uh, the upper right here. And you can see that uh, we're still above 32 for nighttime lows. And we're getting up into the, the mid-50s and some of the lower elevations out here in the east and then in Fremont County. Down here on the, the lower left, you're seeing this as a departure from the normal. And as you can see, most of the state over the last two weeks, the minimum temperatures, nighttime temperatures have been above average, except a few scattered spots here, uh, really no particular area, just kind of scattered around the, around the state. But by and large, uh, zero to three degrees above average for most of the state with some areas, uh, three to six degrees, uh, Fremont County, the Northeast, up here in the, the upper Bighorn uh, areas. We look at maximum temperatures. Uh, daytime highs are mostly above 60 degrees, except for the very high elevations. A lot of the, the plains out here, we're looking at temperatures, uh, high temperatures in the 90s, uh, even higher over here in, the, in that area of uh, Niagara Weston County boundary and in the Bighorn Basin. Looking at it as a departure from the average, here, most of the state of uh, highs have been three to six uh, degrees above the average. Uh, a little bit up here in Cook County, that's six to nine degrees above the average for the last two weeks. 
and then this area here in the central part of the state, Bighorn Basin, and then in the in the western reaches where we're you know, up to three degrees above average. But there's only one little spot in here where you can see temperatures that are below average uh, for the last two weeks, and that's a, a very small area, and it's only a, about a maximum of three degrees below the average. Uh, look at the, the soil moisture as a percentile, and this is comparing uh, one from today, uh, which shows the values through the end of yesterday, with uh, what they were two weeks ago, and you can see quite a bit of deterioration. Right now, about the only, only area that's uh, in the 5 to 10 percent uh, percentile is a small area down here in, uh, in Laramie County, getting over into Albany County, which is corresponding with where we still have no uh, drought signal yet, although about half of this is now in D0. Uh, all this area here in the 10th to 20th percentile is rapidly gone down zero to, zero to two, which is uh, down about as low as you can get. A look at uh, soil moisture at a particular station. This one again is the Thunder Basin Grasslands uh, Mesonet site, uh, just about the Campbell Converse County line area. And you can see these are depths going from 10 centimeters here in the gray down to 50 centimeters or about 20 inches here with this sort of yellowish brown. And you can see it some of the more shallower depths, the results of some uh, storms on the 12th and 13th of uh, July here on the 29th of July when we had a pretty good event. And then last night's uh, uh, storms have produced a little bit of a response down here in the, uh, the 10 centimeter or about four inch uh, depth, but we haven't seen any reaction here at the, at the deeper, deeper levels yet. Probably we'll see a little bit of a bump up, but not, not too much probably. And I'm going to close off here with uh, two graphs showing the drought categories, both as a uh, intensity and percentage through time. This one starts at January 1st, 2000, going up through the monitor that was released uh, this morning. And you can see here now that we've got a few more points on here that our uh, percentage of area of D3 has exceeded now what it was in 2020. And our D2 area is up pretty similar to what it was, was last year as well. We had that similar kick up back here in the, the 2012, 2013 uh, timeframe, but it quickly came back down. Uh, not too optimistic about where this one's gonna go. As you can see up here, uh, looking at the amount of Wyoming that's affected, 99.58% of the state is in either D0 or uh, through D4 uh, conditions. D0 is not technically drought, it's just abnormally dry. So if you look at actual drought conditions, the D1 through D4 categories, um, just over 94% of the state is in the drought, uh, is in drought conditions. And this shows from the beginning of 2020, so you can get a much more uh, expanded view of, of, you know, along with time as far as what the conditions are and, and where we're at right now. The amount of D4 in the state right now is at a, is a measly 0.02%, and that's probably just a little bit of an artifact of uh, clipping at, at a boundary area. But by and large, we're in the D2 or D3 conditions for, the, for a, a good chunk of the state, along with the bulk of it being made up with D1. And with that, we will have Aaron Fiaschetti with USGS to talk about surface water conditions. Thanks, Tony. Um, so, I, so here here's a, a start at looking at stream flow conditions, just current conditions um, as of yesterday in Wyoming. See a fair amount of green on the map. That means normal stream flow conditions. That's anything that's from the 25th to the 70th, 75th percentile. So it's a pretty wide range of flows. Um, and then seeing a, quite a few sites that are showing the below normal, which is the orange, much below normal, which was the red, that's anything less than the 10th percentile. And then a few um, of the all-time lows, which is the dark red. 
So if we could just move to the next slide. Oh no, oh, there it is. Okay, got, got nervous there for a second. So this is a, a chart showing the percent of stream gauges on the um, uh, x-axis and then the just the date on the bottom. And so it, it's the same categories of green being a normal condition, the orange being below normal, that 10 to 24th percentile, the much below normal, the red, and then the bright red is the low. So looking at the last 45 days, um, you know, we have, and just to, to clarify, this is 50 sites, there's 130 in Wyoming. So we, they need 30 years of record to appear on this graph and they need to have no missing data in the re recent period. So we have 51 sites. And just showing here that basically, if you look at early August, there is an improvement in flow conditions where we move to almost 50% of the, these 50 sites showing normal flow conditions from August 1 to 8. Then we see that kind of recede a bit back. And, um, and then we see at the very bottom that we have somewhere around 5% of these 50 gauges are showing the lowest value for the day or for the period. So as of yesterday, that was the Firehole River near West Yellowstone, New Fork River near Big Piney, and the Green River near Labarge were showing the lowest recorded flow for the day. Um, so just, and here we go to the next si slide here. Um, if we look at how that kind of looks on the map comparing the seven day average flow for today on the left compared to the right for what, it, what I presented last month, it looks pretty much the same. We're kind of in similar flow conditions, but a lot of this green on the map, these normal conditions highlighted in these blue boxes are, looks like they appear to be related to management, maybe either reservoir management over on the Snake River we're seeing some higher conditions than normal. And then in the northeastern part of the state, those don't appear to be connected to precipitation events and certainly probably on the same thing on the Platte River. Um, so that those normal flow conditions mostly seem to be connected to, yeah, reservoir operation or stream management. Um, so, but pretty similar conditions to last month. Um, not a whole lot has changed, a lot of below normal, much below normal, and low conditions throughout the state. So we did an exercise to kind of quantify, try and quantify, we know July flows were really low, and we kind of, we wanted to know, well, how low are they? People were asking if those were records or not. Um, so we did a bit of an exercise and we selected a few sites in Wyoming, and I know it's not a comprehensive list of everything that occurred, but what we, what we did is we took the average stream flow for July. So it took this daily value for every month or every day of July and averaged it to one value. And then we compared it to a few different values. Um, so the the orange is going to be your average stream flow for July of 2021. And then we said, well, let's look at the lowest value for the last 20 years. We've had a lot of dry years in the last 20 years. So we went through and looked at the lowest monthly, month, the lowest value in July in the last 20 years. That would be the brown. And then we looked for all time for the entire period of record, what was lowest value for July? That's the dark red or the bright red. And then we have a gray graphic that just shows what the average flow for July is. So if we look at the Bighorn River up near Kane and we have 91 years of record and that goes back to the Dust Bowl for 2021, the 
the average July flow was was pretty darn low, but it's not low enough to break the lowest flow we had in the last 20 years, which was 2002. And it's a ways from the, the record, which was in 1961. But if you compare that to the average flow that should be there over the period of record, it is significantly below that. If we go over to the Powder River near Moorhead, and this is kind of where the, you know, the theory is that not too many people were around in the Dust Bowl to remember how dry it was. So if we picked a value from the last 20 years, we would kind of remember and be able to relate that. But 2006 just happens to be the, uh, the all time low for July for that Powder River near Arvada. So, so we see that Powder River near Arvada is in July of 2021, very low, but not low enough to break the all time record or the, the all time July record for 20 or for the last 20 years. So very low conditions, much, much, much below what, what the average is for that period of record. And that's 90 years. We go down to the Green River at Green River, a little shorter period of record, 69 years. And this is where that 2001 average flow for July or 2021, sorry, average flow for July, it's coming pretty close to that, uh, the record for the last 20 years, that minimum average flow for July. But it, in probably when it all shakes out, it's going to certainly be uh, much above the period of record minimum flow, which occurred in 1977 there. And certainly much, much, much below the average for that period. And then going over to the North Platte above Seminole Reservoir, um, similar conditions, except that 2021, the flow conditions are a little bit higher um, for ju July. And it's uh, and this is a similar situation where 2002 is the period of record minimum flow for July, and it happens to fall within the last 20 years. So uh, probably won't be setting a record for July there. And uh, similar to the, they're all about the same. You know, we're very far below that average. And you know, this kind of point, just kind of looking at these. Uh, varying period of records and varying locations throughout the state um, kind of goes to show to some of the diversity on when minimum flows occurred for the period of record or, or even in the last 20 years, they're not all the same year. So it's, uh, it makes it difficult to try and quantify such a large area. So if we move on to the next slide, this is kind of, we'll just kind of go through those same sites and look at the hydrographs for that. Um, the Bighorn near Kane, it seems like since early July, stream flows have been about the same, pretty close to 1,000 CFS. Um, hasn't changed much, but if you look at that gray or the orange line, that should be your period of record average. Um, that's showing kind of decreasing runoff conditions. But what we've seen in 2021 is just pretty static conditions on the Big Hornet Cane. Uh, Powder River near Arvada since early July, you kind of see that uh, pattern where we're kind of following a decreasing stream flow after runoff with the period of record average that's the orange. The blue kind of mimics that, but a little bit lower uh, flow below the average. And then we see kind of a spike near um, the beginning of an August, which I'm assuming it might be related to a precipitation event. And then quickly dropping off to almost no flow on the powder at Arvada. So getting very close to zero flow there. If we move on to the next slide, um, the Green River at uh, near Green River, uh, pretty consistent flow in 2020, the blue line on the hydrograph, pretty close to 500 CFS, plus or minus, um, not much changing there. 
and then we see the period of record uh, average in the orange showing a de decreasing stream flow from runoff. And um, so we're just kind of, seems like the river's just being kind of held at a constant down there. And then the North Platte above Seminole Reservoir, um, the below average flows in the blue line um, with it looks like a little bit of spike maybe from precipitation or management here in early August and then that decreasing flow. Um, so staying much below the average. Next slide, please, Tony. And then just looking quickly here at reservoirs, uh, almost all the reservoirs in Wyoming lost quite a bit of storage. You can see that in the teacup diagrams as there's generally a lot more white than there is blue. Um, and then just, uh, there's only a few reservoirs, large reservoirs that have more than 80% storage and that'd be Boysen, Bighorn and Flaming Gorge. Um, so, and uh, Boysen actually looks pretty good. It's 90% uh, full right now. So, uh, but in general, a lot of stored water has been depleted over the last month. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. And next up is Jeff Cowley with the State Engineer's Office, who will talk a bit about water rights administration and uh, some bit on the Flaming Gorge releases. Hello, everybody. Um, as you can see on the map here, it's uh, getting more brown. If you've uh, seen previous maps, there was a lot more gray, and, and we kind of had some discussion on as to why. Um, there was probably wasn't enough water for folks to even worry about fighting over. Um, as you can see now, it's getting to be a bit more. In Division One, we have eight streams under regulation, and you could add another that technically were under um, a summer allocation, which is uh, North Platte diversions between Pathfinder and, and then Glendo Reservoir. Um, we have a limitation on that stretch of the river. It's not technically a call for regulation, just more monitoring. Uh, Division Two, we have 17 streams under regulation. Division Three, we have 11, and Division Four, another 11. Anecdotally, um, from our hydrographers and, and superintendents, people are now squabbling over the little tiny bit of water that's left. So um, more calls are coming in all the time. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Tony. Um, this is, is discussing the Flaming Gorge Reservoir um, and its releases that uh, maybe folks saw and, and got a little scared about. Uh, back in July, they started, um, Technically, on uh, July 15th, they started releases out of Flaming Gorge, Re Flaming Gorge Reservoir. Uh, they started off at 860 CFS. They've slowly bumped that up 50 CFS at a time. Um, on July 15th, well, I, I did some quick math because a lot of folks were complaining, as you can see here in the second paragraph, that these releases will only drop the level of the reservoir by about three and a half feet. Um, I did some quick math, did the elevation on the 15th, the current elevation and releases, and it looks like we're right on track with, with what the Bureau thought um, would be happening to the reservoir, which is good to know. Um, where there's still a couple feet left to go. They will be uh, releasing into October. Um, as you can see on that Flaming Gorge uh, row going across there, here in August, they're releasing about 42,000 acre feet. September will be 43 and October will be 27,000 acre feet to get up to that 125,000 acre feet total out of these reservoir or out of this reservoir. Um, like I said, they're, they're on track right now as of, well, I'm sorry, as of the 13th of August, they're releasing six, uh, 1,610 CFS um, at, at, on an hourly basis to, uh, to make up for those or get that water moved downstream. Um, as you can see here on that last paragraph, no Wyoming water rights are tied to this release. This is the Bureau of Reclamation moving their water downstream to try and prop up the elevations in Lake Powell and Lake Mead so that we don't get below those critical elevations there. And, and right off the top of my head, I can't quote them right now, but they are moving that water down um, to, to save those reservoirs and, and stay out of uh, essentially trouble with those reservoirs. So um, if anybody has any questions, I think we hold those to the end. So I, I believe I'm done, Tony. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jeff. Next up is Jared Allen with uh, the Weather Service in Cheyenne to talk a bit about forecasts and outlooks. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. So looking at the seven day quantitative precipitation forecast, or just basically the rain forecast for the next seven days, uh, looking at a pretty good amount. Uh, we actually have a, a rainfall system, a weather system moving across the state as we speak. Right now, it's starting to produce some showers and thunderstorms across the southeast that might be a little bit more robust. Uh, but generally, showers and widespread, um, general showers and widespread moderate showers further to the north and northwest. So overall, between three tenths of an inch to maybe an inch and a half up there in the north and northwest. Looks like some of the higher terrain uh, should make out a little bit better as well with some of that orographic lift as the system spins on through over the next 24 hours. So the bighorns, uh, the higher terrain of the bighorns will hopefully pick up an inch to all just shy of two inches. Uh, but even the high plains across the eastern portion of the state, uh, somewhere between 0.75 to 1.5 and further to the southeast, a little bit less, uh, but it couldn't have some locally higher amounts from some of the thunderstorms that will be coming through this afternoon. And then for South Central, a little bit high, higher amounts in the higher terrain for the Snowies and the Sierra Madres as well. And then for the Southeast, excuse me, for the Southwest, maybe a quarter to half inch down that way. So not certainly drought busting by any means, but this is probably one of the better maps I've seen overall <laughs> this summer. So we'll take what we can get and we'll see how it, it pans out with the data next week as far as any potential changes for the drought monitor. But overall, this is a, a good, good trend, uh, at least for today, tomorrow, and uh, partially into Saturdays where the rainfall will occur. Uh, however, by Sunday into early next week, we're looking to dry out uh, into the next week. And then kind of looking longer term, unfortunately, we're going to be a little bit more favored towards being on the dry side again. So let's kind of get, get to that with the next slide right here. Uh, so in the six to 10 day precipitation in the upper right, unfortunately looking at pretty solid numbers uh, for being below normally uh, favored for lower than normal precipitation uh, from August 24th through the 28th timeframe across the entire state. And then maybe even a slightly stronger signal further to the north west, uh, especially up in Montana, Idaho, and, and the Yellowstone areas uh, for lower than normal precipitation possibilities. And then on the flip side for temperature outlooks, it's kind of a, a mixed bag split across the state, slightly below normal uh, for the northeast, kind of neutral conditions there in the central, and further to the southwest, slightly favored for above normal temperatures as we go in towards the, the end of the month. Uh, for August. So unfortunately, the monsoonal moisture and the Pacific moisture that we did receive uh, at the very beginning of August or, or late July, where you saw some of that reflected in the USGS stream flow maps that helped a little bit, but we, and we'll see what we pick up today and, and tomorrow. But overall, we're going to be going into a drier period uh, into next week and perhaps into the two week period also. So speaking of the two week period, Let's talk about the eight to 14 day precipitation outlook and continued below normal uh, favored conditions, 40, 50%, and even a stronger signal just, just barely north of us in Montana at 60%. That's a really strong signal overall for that region uh, to be lacking a decent amount of, of moisture. So unfortunately, whatever we can try and pick up these next couple of days, it looks like the long-term does look to be on the drier side. And then for the temperature outlook, uh, slightly worsening conditions, again, favored for above normal temperatures. So with the dry dryness and the hot temperatures potentially resuming, uh, we might have a return to some fire weather concerns as we go into the next two weeks or three weeks uh, towards the end of August and into the beginning of September. And what, next slide. And this will be my last one before I turn it over to BLM. And this is taking, a, and if you click once, Tony, we should have an animation pop up here. So this is just looking at ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation component. Uh, basically, it's re reflective of what are the equatorial temperatures doing uh, at, out there in the Pacific Ocean and how large scale patterns are, are based off of those. Uh, so right now we are ENSO neutral uh, right now. Uh, but we are forecasts, again, this upcoming winter, if you want to click one more, Tony, 
uh, to go back into a La Nina forecast as well. So this is what we did last winter uh, was a La Nina. So we're looking for a double La Nina going back to 1950. Uh, there have been 12 double La Ninas in the past. And um, whenever those typically occur, uh, it is generally favored that we are, are lower, typically favored for lower precipitation. There are a couple years where we get above normal precipitation. But again, we typically see where uh, going into October, November, December, or November, December, January, uh, that's where those probabilities of La Nina really start to peak up in that long range forecast. So uh, it really all depends on, on where that storm track sets up, uh, where again, we did have that La Nina last winter. Uh, we're forecast to have another La Nina this winter. And the storm track last winter stayed super far north, uh, well into Canada, and then, and then dropped down over across the Great Lakes. So if that's able to get a little bit further south uh, across the Northern Rockies, then maybe we'll have an average snowpack year. Uh, but if it stays north again, like it did last winter, then we might be looking at a, a lower than normal snowpack again for this upcoming winter. So we'll kind of continue to monitor these trends. And if you want to go, <clears throat> excuse me, one more slide, uh, <clears throat> we'll then turn it over to uh, the BLM partners for their fuel updates. And that partner is Casey Cheesebro with the BLM to talk about this. So Casey. You see, this is Wendy. If you're talking, you might be muted, or it looks like you're still muted. Oh, apologies. I started the video and didn't unmute, but I think everybody's got me now. Uh, so I did leave. A yes. Perfect. Okay. I left, uh, for folks that are new, I left some of the information here on the slide for the energy release component. Just a quick description of what that is. Um, basically just a uh, kind of a summary fuel moisture, a quick snapshot that we look at throughout the fire season. Uh, the nice thing with the energy release component, it does combine the, the live and dead fuel moistures from, from all size classes of fuels. Uh, I think back in June, I went into a, a little bit more depth on that, but, but basically, uh, obviously we'll, we're looking at how a fire will burn uh, based on fuels conditions. We're worried about both the live fuels and the dead fuels. And so, um, the ERC values take take both of those things into consideration and give us a, a pretty good snapshot of where we sit. So, um, currently in Wyoming, as as a lot of folks have pointed to already, you know that eastern portion of the state, northeastern especially with the higher temperatures and and less precipitation, we're looking at ERC values up there that were um, either above the 90th percentile or even above the 97th percentile uh, for the last 15 years. So some pretty Pretty elevated conditions up there, and I think that's has played out uh, a little bit the last couple of weeks with some of the fire occurrence around the state. And as you look over into the Black Hills, obviously uh, some of the same things there, the Black Hills in Wyoming as well as in the South Dakota. Um, one thing I want to point out that these values are pulled at 1,300 every day, and so you know the the, the new values weren't available uh, when I built the slide earlier today, and so. I think part of what we're seeing with that split from west to east in the state is, is that moisture as it moved into the state. And so as you see some of the ERC values there in uh, Cody, Evanston, the western part of the state were quite a bit lower. Uh, I suspect some of that has to do with just that the moisture hadn't, hadn't reached other parts of the state yet. And we would see some moderation in those if we were to look uh, even right now. So. Uh, Again, back to a, a real strong correlation to the drought that, that was talked about earlier in the presentation. As you, as you look at the drought map, we're, we're definitely seeing that play out with the, the ERC values around the state. Um, the low elevation fuels are, are cured where the moisture has been lacking. One thing we've seen pretty well statewide is, is just not that there's been a lot of moisture, but it's it uh, we haven't had the long, warm and dry uh, periods, I guess, that we've seen in, in a couple of the more busy fire seasons the last couple of years. And so, um, again, not, not that it's been a lot of moisture, but it's been it's been timely at times and, and kept things sort of greened up in areas and, 
right about the time this starts to dry out, uh, a little bit more moisture moves in and it just kind of help moderate things. Um, as Jared mentioned, uh, looking at that warmer and drier weather uh, coming into the state next week. And so one thing we time of year is that uh, a lot of our live fuels or our, our grasses, our shrubs, those types of things um, are, are starting to trend kind of on the early, the early side of where they'll start to trend towards that seasonal dormancy. And so what we'll see around the state is um, those things are going to be their, their ability to uptake moisture. So your sagebrush, uh, your mountain shrubs, your grasses, those things are going to be more, uh, more reactive to the, the weather conditions. Just a warm, dry day will start to dry those out a little bit more. And uh, the moisture that we have will have a, a shorter impact on those fuels. They'll, they'll absorb some of the, the moisture from the atmosphere. But as far as uptaking and storing moisture as they move towards dormancy, that stuff will, uh, that, that'll decrease. And so, uh, yeah, that warmer, drier weather that Jared spoke about um, earlier, that's going to be, be of concern here as we go into August and September. And if we could go to the, the next slide, Tony. Um, I did pull just a couple of the graphs to two different corners of the states so over on the Shoshone National Forest. You can see in the map there in the, the bottom left with that RM01 area. So that's just a composite of the weather stations that are up in that area. And uh, what you see is the blue line is our current values um, for the year for 2021. The red lines are the, the maximum values um, that have been recorded at those weather stations. And then you have a light gray line there that's the average. And so um, kind of spoke about that, that periodic moisture. And I think you see that in these graphs fairly well where we right about the time we've gotten up into those uh, that 97th percentile, that darker uh, gray horizontal line. Uh, we've got moisture, it's brought it back down, then we dry out for a little while, it peaks again, drops back down, and um, now you see the, the effect of that moisture that moved in. And so now the values are pretty low. I would suspect that uh, here in the next couple of weeks, we'll see that climb back up at least to that 90, 90th to 97th percentile um, based on the, the weather that's forecast. And then looking over at Devil's Tower, I thought that was a, just a good contrast to looking at the one from Shoshone. Um, obviously, the, the northeastern corner of the state, that's uh, like folks have shown with the, the precip amounts and the higher than, higher than average temperatures up in those areas, we're seeing uh, still some of those drops, but not nearly as significant. So we've stayed pretty well above average most of the summer there, uh, going all the way back to, to June when we had the really hot and dry weather. And so uh, I think that if you were to look, look at that Devil's Tower tomorrow, you'd see a, a pretty significant drop with the Moisture that came in, this just not, this wasn't picked up as of this morning, but um, again, based on weather coming in, we'll see that go back into that 97 uh, percentile value. So um, really the only other thing is we go from August to September, I'd point out from a, a fire standpoint or a fuel standpoint is just we, we are getting significantly shorter days, a couple minutes uh, shorter, I believe every day with day length. And so that'll affect our, our burn periods and then our ability, uh, the fuel's ability to to dry out and, and, uh, and whatnot. But I think one of the close, you know, I was looking at some other values uh, right before the presentation. And obviously the Mullen fire was a significant fire event that we had last year that started in September, burned um, well into October. And so we we're kind of moving this towards September and, and into the early fall. Um, we're sitting a lot, a lot better, especially in the Southern part of the state. You know, that's a, a good reference fire, I think, but the thousand hour fuel moistures, which are basically our, our large dead fuels, so three inches and, and above in diameter system here, the really large branches and, and logs basically out there in the, in the forest, those values were around 11% last year in early September. And right now they're sitting down in that same area down in the Medicine Bow Range, uh, sitting around 16%, 17%. So. Uh, much better off down in that part of the state than we were last year and, and uh, yeah we'll just have to we'll see what see what plays out with Jared's forecast and, and where things head but um, as you can see in these graphs it, it bounces around it's fairly fairly sporadic and that'll that'll be even uh, more noticeable here as things go more towards that seasonal dormancy so I'm um, kind of hard to you know, I guess I just reiterate it's kind of a snapshot of where we're at today um, here in a week, it may, may look drastically different as you can see in those graphs. So, 
Um, I'll close with that and uh, kick it over to Anthony. Thanks, guys. Hey, so for those that I uh, haven't seen before, my name is Andy Schultz. I'm the fire management officer for the state of Wyoming. Um, to kind of kick things off here, uh, as Casey had alluded to a little bit, it's been fairly quiet the last few weeks um, in regards to fire occurrence here in uh, Wyoming. And I thought it would be fitting to give um, a little bit of a national overview. Uh, we'll make that real quick. But uh, as you can see, GAC is just kind of geographic area and they break it up for, for ease of reading. Uh, but right now we're dealing with a total of 110 incidents across the United States um, that have some sort of significance to them with over 3 million cumulative acres burning. The crews and engines are more really for us um, just to kind of get a sense of what's committed to these fires nationally. Um, and then the nation's firefighting reserve of personnel, we've roughly got between 30 to 35,000 uh, people that participate in wildland fire. And right now, uh, nearly 26,000 of those are committed. So stuff is getting pretty tight to get a hold of. Um, nationally, uh, the largest fire that we've got going on is the Dixie Fire in California. Uh, that's actually uh, almost burned to the size of the state of Rhode Island. Um, and uh, I was on a call with Tom Porter, uh, their state forester or fire chief, if you will. Um, it would have been uh, yesterday. And I think it's the first fire that they're aware of that's burned completely over the mountain range and down to the valley below from west to east. Um, so in the time that they've been tracking fires, it's the first one to do that. So it's, it's pretty interesting and they're saying there's no end in sight for that one. Uh, why this is relevant uh, to Wyoming is the only fire that we've really got of note is going to be Crater Ridge. That's been burning for a little while now, and that's going to be up in the Big Horns, the northern uh, tier of the state there. Um, with that one, a Type 3 team is currently on it. However, they've uh, requested a Type 2 team, uh, meaning that uh, they feel the complexity is high enough that um, so a little bit more uh, a capable team uh, should be coming in to, to manage that fire. Uh, due to what's going on nationally, we're not able to get one of those here in Wyoming, uh, just due to the values at risk, right? When we've got 30 cabins threatened on the big horns, it doesn't uh, really hold a candle to burning entire towns down in uh, maybe in states further west, Washington, Oregon, and California. So uh, that's really uh, the only fire we've had going on here uh, of significance for the last month or so uh, in Wyoming. If I want to slide to the next slide. Uh, we'll go through outlooks here real quick. Um, these are probably going to look fairly similar to what I presented here uh, last month or the month before. Uh, there's really no major shift in prediction for above average um, or above normal significant wildfire potential across the state of Wyoming. Um, that's going to remain uh, through September. And then what is a little concerning, and Casey alluded to it a little bit here, uh, is the end of September or that mid-September to early October time frame is traditionally uh, when Wyoming experiences largest fires on record. Think Mullen, think Roosevelt. Um, that's the kind of fires that we, that we see uh, mid-September into October. So um, that's really where at least my sites are going to be uh, set in terms of planning and, and having personnel ready for, for that kind of fire occurrence moving as we move through the next month and a half here. So uh, with that, that's going to be about it for the outlook and kind of what's going on fire occurrence wise in Wyoming. All right. Thanks, Anthony. And now Wendy Kelly with UW Extension and the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub will talk about how you can get involved and wrap us up. All right. Thank you, Tony and everyone. I, I just wanted to share the U.S. Drought Monitor that was released this morning. As a reminder, this is what we kicked off the, the webinar with, um, that we have had some degradations throughout parts of Wyoming um, with a little bit of improvement there in the Southwest. Uh, we always like to remind everybody at the end of the webinar that you can get involved in ways that you can do that in helping us understand the conditions out on the ground. So there's two ways. One is by becoming a Coco Raws uh, volunteer, so you would report your precipitation or a lack of on a daily basis, ideally. So this is the map on the left from yesterday morning. Um, the second way that you can get involved is by submitting condition monitoring observer reports through the Seymour system, and there is a bit.ly link on this slide. Um, and I, I'm going to move through this really quickly, Tony, um, if you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, 
photos are really important and help us in understanding and visually seeing the conditions out on the ground. But we also encourage folks to report regularly into the system. But the final note I want to make on this is to know that these reports and photos are available to the public. So if you haven't gone in, you can click around and see that. Um, I just like to bring um, your, your awareness or draw your awareness to that point for yourself or ag producers that may be um, support submitting reports. Um, so with that, I, I wanna thank all the presenters today. And this is the, their contact information, their agencies that they're a part of. And um, we'll get ready to transition to some questions and answers.